Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, the Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on the Jet Setter Show. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. My pleasure to welcome Wayne Kurtz to the show. He is a CPA and a CFP. He is the president of Carlsberg International Insurance Corporation Limited, and he splits his time between Belize and Central America and the United States. And Wayne, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well, Jason. Thank you for having me on. And you're coming to us from Pittsburgh today. So tell us about what it is you do. Uh, what we do is we, we have a kind of a unique product for a certain type of individual who is interested in moving assets offshore and having the ability to own those assets with inside the advantages of a life insurance policy. And specifically, just like the U.S. or any domestic policy, it offers an opportunity for tax deferral on the growth of the assets. Okay. And so it's pretty much the same as the way a U.S whole life insurance policy or universal life insurance policy works? Yeah. It, the, the main similarity is the tax laws from an from a IRS purpose are exactly the same from a, and we'll just say whole life or a variable universal life. Our product is a variable universal life. And the difference, the main difference is unlike a domestic policy, for instance, Jason, if you wanted to go buy a, you know, a policy with a whatever, $100,000 death benefit, you exchange cash as premium for that death benefit. And then you might have some investment choices under there that you could pick from if it was a variable policy in the United States. I love how insurance companies call it a death benefit. I just always thought that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. It is just true. It's a benefit to the heirs, right? Not so much yourself personally. First of all, I've got a few levels of skepticism, Wayne, that I'd like you to address. So let's first just talk about insur- life insurance in general, okay? And then you can talk about any tweaks that come with an offshore policy as, as this one is. So this is a life insurance insurance company based in Belize, right? Correct. Okay. We support in Belize. And uh, is it an actual, what is Carlsberg? Are you a broker? I mean, you're not an insurance company, right? Yeah, no. Carlsberg International Insurance is an insurance company. No, I'm not a broker. We actually have the product um, and it's an insurance company. So do you, do you own this insurance company? Personally, no. No, no, no. There's a group of investors, shareholders, board of directors, same as any other corporation. Okay. But you're the president of it. Correct. Okay, great. So how long has Carlsberg Insurance been around? Uh, Started in 2003 and going through a lot of the legwork in the first couple years of getting the licenses, getting coordination with the Belizean insurance law, and more importantly, getting the opinion letter from a U.S. law firm took the first couple years. It's a lot of legwork on the front end. So it's been around since 2003, really with clients, I'd say 2005. So U.S. life insurance companies like to brag about how they're 100,000 years old. (laughs) You know, we've been in business for over 100 years, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, so was Lehman Brothers. (laughs) So uh, that didn't work for them. So this is a pretty new company. I mean, first of all, what do you say to people who are concerned about that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, 
almost never comes up in a conversation. And it's kind of crazy, you would think, based on the times that we live in. But you have to realize Carlsberg International Insurance Company provides the shell or the product, but the reinsurance is all used by one of our re- is offshore uh, offsetted by our reinsurance company. An example would be if someone had a hundred thousand dollar death benefit, about ninety five percent of that is reinsured by another insurance company, just like anyone else, which is a Warren Buffett company. It's called Genre. That's who we use in most cases. And the other side is the assets that are contributed. And as I was saying earlier, unlike a U.S. policy, our clients don't contribute cash. They contribute assets, gold, silver, hedge funds, all these various things that make up the premium. Those are all held in what is called a separate account. So the, the biggest in, it, in its custodian outside. And what that means is in the event of a Carlsberg bankruptcy, let's just use that, right, as an example from a risk perspective, the client is safer than they are in the U.S. Because if you had a U.S. policy with the Prudential and they went bankrupt, you'd kind of stand in line as a general creditor. We don't carry assets on our balance sheet, such as like a Prudential or some of the U.S. carriers. They are all separate accounts. So if we went bankrupt, based on the rules of how they set up the whoever the owner is of the policy, those assets are distributed based on that. So it's very, very different from that perspective than a U.S. domestic company. Right. But I I mean, and pardon me for being so skeptical, and I don't want to belabor this point. I just want to ask it real quickly. So the insurance policy holder is is basically dependent on whether that reinsurance contract is right, whether, whether, you know, it's it's correct, that the company's going to honor it, all of that kind of stuff. The reinsurance company, this is a company, the one you mostly use. Now, you might use your reinsurance, you might use different reinsurance companies, but this one is one owned by Warren Buffett, right? Yeah, it's Genry. I think they're the Genry. third largest in the world. So, I mean, <laughs> we, we, we're pretty conservative, Jason, because our clients are ultra-conservative group. And we have other reinsurance, but the vast majority of it goes to Genry. What, what's the difference between being a broker and brokering a life insurance policy to another company or being an insurance company and using reinsurance? Isn't it kind of the same thing? I no, mean, you're just bro- having someone else do the insurance either way, no matter what you call it, right? Yeah, a little different. I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, some of my, one of my previous firms was a company called Aon, $12 billion global company. And we were a broker. So we selected various insurance companies, reinsurance, all those various things for a client, and were paid a commission. Very different when you're the insurance company. You're on the other side, not really brokering. It's one product, one specific thing for our client from that side. So it is, a, it is kind of a different world difference between a broker and an insurance company. And why did you pick Belize, I guess you personally, and then your company, this company that opened there, Back in 2005, Carlsberg, I, I mean, are they basically Americans or who's, who yeah. opened that company? Yeah, you have, uh, you have a lot of Americans. You have various groups of, from the shareholder base and board. But I think one of the big things was, you know, some of the original founders had been working in their own businesses in Belize, the U.S. companies in Belize for some years and found that it was on the uprise. And the biggest thing that was going on in Belize uh, was you know you had a lot of new companies that were were started that didn't want to pay the price tags of what it's what it cost to you know open up in Bermuda or open up in the Caymans and the big benefit I can tell you was purely everyone speaks English now that sounds basic and I know that not that big of a deal but it's a major factor when you're dealing with any type of service organization in terms of customer service English being the native language was a big driver and I think also the education of the of the team that they were able to pull together so those were two attractions the, the hurdle rate of, of entry was less expensive i mean that's the other thing as well yeah yeah so i mean i would assume it's pretty easy to like do business in belize it's such a little country it's mm-hmm. i can't imagine the government there is too strict about getting licenses and things like that i mean they're probably dying to have some more businesses there right they are and it's it's a very business business friend, friendly community i mean they have a complete infrastructure so it's not a bunch of people running a uh a, a crazy area where it's just started. I mean, they have, um, it's kind of, you know, you know, it was British Honduras, follows that British role. They've got government, things of that nature. So there is some stability and there's no question. I mean, the biggest reason, that, you know, people think of Belize is it's because of the dive thing, right? They've got the blue hole, people tour there. That's the biggest revenue source, no question. But they do have 
five, six different cultures that live there from around the world. You've got farming and things of that nature. So, you know, they are very pro-business. There's no question. Okay. So my skepticism about insurance, these policies in general is, I, you know, I always say we've got financial planners that are constantly trying to sell these insurance policies to our real estate investment clients. And, you know, there's that whole movement of the bank of you, the bank on you, the bank on yourself, the be your own bank, the infinite banking, all of these words they use to describe it. And basically all they're saying is buy a whole life policy and withdraw from it later and that kind of stuff. It's sort of a complicated deal. Doug Andrew, you know, was a big promoter of it. You're probably familiar with Missed Fortune and all of the stuff in this world, right? So my big objection to that is that insurance companies basically don't want you to understand inflation and they're paying you back in cheaper dollars. So they like to say, well, these financial planners go around and say, well, I offer people guaranteed lifetime income. But after inflation, you know, yes, you'll, you may get the payout as long as the insurance company stays in business and everything. That's the likelihood is you'll get the money. The question is, how much will the money be worth? And I personally think we're coming into a time of pretty severe inflation risk. Your thoughts on that? Again, I think from our perspective, the risk is to the client. It is not to us. We don't invest the money. <laughs> it's a very different model, and I think that's the difference. I mean, if you ask me, would I buy a whole life insurance policy in the United States and consider that investment? No way. Absolutely not. And for exactly the reasons you just said. Because most people buy or never, they don't buy life insurance, right? They are always sold life insurance, that whole agent mentality. Our product is completely different, and it is not for everyone. I tell them, I said, you know, if you've got a taxable situation, you got highly appreciated assets. You're concerned about the dollar. You want to move offshore. You're concerned about what's going on with the government. And you want some benefits from a tax perspective. Then it might make sense. But it is, it is a different type of clientele. I don't have a client that is coming to me and saying, I want to buy a $100,000 life insurance policy. Can you help me out? What are they saying to you? What do they want to do? It is a accredited investor who is looking to mainly have a shelter on highly appreciated assets, they own an S corporation with a bunch of shares and they say, you know what, I might sell this in the future. Is there any way I can contribute my shares into this policy as premium? Yeah. Can you put Swiss francs as your death benefit? Yes. Can I have it denominated in different currencies? Yes. Can I stick a apartment building in there? Yes. That's the kind of client we have that and it's not the client who's investing in the, the S&P 500 index fund. It's not. I mean, they might own that, but it's not. It's more of a worldly client. So what do they do? What do you mean? Like, you know, so I have a bunch of U.S. real estate, for example, that I own. You you mean I can put my real estate into the plan? What? I don't understand. You said someone can put an apartment building in there. I don't get it. Sure. In in most cases, we would have a client that would own something offshore. It makes a lot more sense if you own the apartment building offshore. But can you restructure the ownership of your apartment building in the United States to be owned by and insurance policies offshore, yes, all you're doing is re-registering the title and ownership of it. Now, again, you've got to go look through the tax ramifications of doing that because it's much, much easier when you have assets offshore. Most of our clients would do it offshore. They got a house in that they're renting in Spain, got a client, does the same thing. He takes the house, the rental income all sits in the policy, pays no tax as long as he doesn't pull it out. So it's better for someone who has real estate assets offshore versus onshore. So you wouldn't necessarily put your U.S. real estate into it. You could. You contribute shares, Jason. It's shares. So if you got it in an LLC, which you know, of course, you know this world. I've been in real estate for twenty years, right? You're not going to. You own them in a bunch of LLCs. Protect yourself on liability. Contribute shares into that. Is how you could do it. Oh, or you can just buy a policy and put cash into it, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's no. You can. I can tell you, most of our clients don't do that. Um, Why they don't do they that do that? In the U.S. You can, buy, you can buy a policy in the U.S. with cash. Right, but but aren't clients coming to you because they want to have they want to have money outside of the U.S. Maybe because they're scared about what's going on in the U.S. They do, and again, maybe we dial it down a level, Jason. I, mean, I think it's more of cash in another currency. That's what we see the most. I'm not saying you couldn't do dollars. You could keep cash offshore in a bank account and use that to fund the insurance. Absolutely, but it's more of uh, we just see happen to see more of individuals that are interested in different currencies to own. So so what you're saying is they're exchanging into another currency and then buying your policy? Yeah, or yeah, or they're having that as one of the asset classes they're holding in the inside of the portfolio. So so say someone comes to you and they say, "Okay, I've got $100,000 and I, you know, I've got a bunch of money in the US, but I've got 100,000 that I want to get outside of the US. I want to just 
have offshore affairs for whatever reason. Privacy, asset protection, I don't know. The IRS has made it very restrictive now. You've got to be very careful. You obey all the laws, of course, so that goes without saying. But what do people do? They give you $100,000, and then what happens? Actually, they would not give it to us. What they would normally, if it was just 100000 I just say just. I know that's a lot of money. But the first thing would be opening, opening up a bank account offshore, okay, and having it set up. Maybe they're setting up an asset protection trust. They're doing other planning. But the first hurdle is, you know, our average premium is, is between two hundred dollars to $400,000 a year for five years. So okay. it, this is a different type of product because it's someone who has – is they've got a, you know, whatever the net, you know, the accredited investor rules. It's either they're making 200000 or they have a net worth of over a million. Over a million. So they're carving out a portion and they will say, I'll contribute 100000 a year for five years to make sure we're compliant. Taxes work well when I pull the money out. That's kind of what we say. So if someone had 100000 and they want to re-diversify their assets, again, I don't think it makes sense for the insurance. You'd open up a bank account somewhere, wherever. Again, you can't do Switzerland anymore. They're not going to take U.S. clients, as we're well aware. So they would maybe go, you know, Caymans, Belize, wherever, you know, that kind of thing. That would be step one. So they they fund it with $100,000 a year for five years. And then what happens? And normally it would be assets. So again, they can use any asset they own. We've got clients that have collectibles in the policies, as an example. So then, you know, there's a, it's a life insurance policy. There's a death benefit based on their age that would pay to their heirs. And, And most of our clients are not interested in the death benefit. But you have to have the death benefit to get the tax deferred wrapper of the asset that's inside to grow tax free. So we usually will structure it where we try to buy the minimum amount of death benefit that we can, thus the lowest the lowest mortality expenses that what Gen Re is going to charge. Right. They've got it based on how old you are. And of course, you've got to get a medical and all the same things apply. But everything has to occur offshore. So medicals, financial information, there's financial justification. You know, all those various things. They want to look at tax returns, you know, those kinds of things, make sure that it's financially justified. So then you have a policy that's in place. And after five years, you know, they can do what they want with it. I mean, they can borrow money out if they want or assets out tax free or just leave the policy in force. It kind of depends. But they're, each of the goals are going to be different, as you know. Right, right. And what kind of return on investment can they expect? Whatever their investments are, it's what they're picking. We're not picking. We don't do anything with the investments. So oh, whatever they- okay, okay. So, so yeah, with the investment, it's just either cash or shares in an LLC or whatever, as you mentioned before. But what if they just come to you and say, I want to put in 100000 a year? What happens then? They just maybe leave it in a foreign currency bank account? Yeah, it, good question. I mean, I guess there's, there's two things. The first is for an, any offshore policy to make sure that it's IRS compliant, the individual must have five asset classes. Okay, so you can't just say, I'm going to just stick 100000 of cash in. It has to be broken up in the way the IRS, the, the rule, and I'll, I'll go through it quickly. You can have no more than 55% in one asset class, no more than 70% in two asset classes, no more than 80 in three, no more than 90% in four. So the minimum you've got to have is five. Maximum, can you can go, of course, more than that. That's the pass the diversification test by the IRS. If you don't, all the growth is taxable. So so it's absolutely imperative that you have five asset classes. But the first part of your question was, what happens if a client has 100,000? Well, the other component of the IRS is you have to have an investment advisor, trustee, individual other than you appointed. You cannot trade in the account. It's not like owning a brokerage account. And those investments, we can, you know, we can help someone and guide them to some people they could talk to, but we do not make the investment decisions. It's ultimately up to them and their advisor when they set it up. All right, good. What else should people know about this? You know, I guess a couple things. One is there are some requirements that that are important to file. With all the new disclosure rules, it falls under all the new disclosure, the TD90, all, you know, the 8635, the new form. I don't know if I have the number right, but the new one that came out. In addition, there is a form 720 that is required. And when I talk to accountants, I tell them, make sure you have your client fill out the forms. And those, the compliance is important to disclose it, they, just like anything else if you have offshore. There's no attack on anything other than you just need to disclose. The other thing would be is to, if a client or an individual is looking at it, analyze what the overall costs are. It's like anything else. What's the mortality expense charges that they're charging? What, are, what is the cost for the implementation, the sales load? 
it's in most cases, it can be less expensive than buying domestically because you save about 3% with not paying state premium tax that you have in the United States. So you, you, and that's on the premiums. So you eliminate that. You pay 1% excise tax. So you're probably ahead a couple points. And then you figure out what the, you know, determine what the, the, the loads are. And the loads are not like in the U.S. And I'm sure you know, Jason, I mean, the average commission rate for an insurance premium to the agent in the United States is, you know, 50% minimum up to 90%. I mean, they're... That, that is just insane. Do you want to just elaborate that on, on that yeah. for a moment? You know, so so yeah. so an agent, a life, no wonder they like selling life insurance, right? So, <laughs> and we've You're done, right. we've done shows right. on this before because it's just mind boggling to me. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, no one really knows how much the agent is getting. And you said 50 to 90%. Yeah, I'll give you an example. If it's a term policy, you know, a temporary coverage, not a permanent. They like don't a, make much money on those, right? No, they actually make a lot more. Oh, Normally, it's okay. between 90 and 103% of the premium is commission, okay? So, and then a more permanent product, the minimum threshold would be about 50%, up to, you know, 70, 80, 90%, depending upon bonuses of the first year premium. Then they receive a renewal going forward, depending upon how it was structured. When you go offshore, the highest I have ever seen is 5%. You're talking probably in the 2 to 4% range is the total load on an offshore, any offshore carrier. They'll all be like that. So it's, it's a very, very different model than onshore. So, you know, the insurance agents, you know, generally, you know, and the most of the people that work in this space are investment people because they understand they charge a client a percentage of their assets, right, as a management fee. It's the same thing with an offshore life insurance. It's like assets under management because they're normally running the money that's inside an offshore policy. The reverse is in the U.S. I'm an insurance agent in the United States was probably would probably not be real enamored to make 2% commission on their on a, on a new policy. They're going to be able to get something, but, you know, at 50% of it. Big difference from that side. Yeah, pretty amazing. You know, one more question for you. You're in the same building as Key Bank, and I actually opened an account there, never funded it, but I did open an account about a year and a half ago. And I was just wondering, I went there and, you know, I just honestly didn't feel that comfortable. You know, I know this is a, the bank a lot of Americans use when they do the offshore banking. I've, I've heard about it. I've read about it. But it seemed like such a little sort of small kind of Mickey Mouse operation, frankly. I, I And, you know, they have no FDIC insurance. They did say, though, in counter to that question, is that they have much higher reserve requirements than U.S. banks. Well, I would believe that. I mean, the whole U.S. banking system is a, is a house of cards, <laughs> really. You're right. <laughs> Yeah, it's about a 20, I think it's 25% or 30% threshold is what the reserve requirements there versus the U.S. I don't know what it is. Right now, I think the banks are at about 6%. So it's a big difference from there. But maybe to answer your question on comfort level, I, I think the one thing that I always mention is, is when I t talk to a client, again, I'm, on, I'm not on the banking side. That's not my space. I understand. But, but it's, it's important that if you look at all of just, we'll just take the country of Belize as an example. There's a, several banks but you're not going to find billion dollar banks. It's a very different model. And it's a small little country. It's like various other places that you can go as well. It's just, it, that's kind of the mentality that you'll find in Central America from the banking jurisdictions, things of that nature. But it, that's kind of the norm. I mean, that's what I've seen when I've looked, when I've gone to some of the different banks in the various places through Central America, you're not going to see an infrastructure with, you know, remember n none of the clients are, for a lot of the international banks, will be locals. In a lot of cases, they're just banks that will deal with Canadians, U.S., Europeans that you have to live and reside and be a citizen outside of the country. That's a, and it, you know, again, you're not having tellers and a very different kind of model than walking into a you know Bank of America building or something. But you address great points. I mean, and I think every everyone should do their own due diligence with management. You know, looking at the balance sheet. Um, seeing where really where the debt is. I mean, are they lending money on, you know, on real estate, things of that nature? What does the reserve requirement look like? And you got to realize, I mean, when you go offshore, I mean, if it's a $50 million bank, a $100 million bank, that's big in the Central American region, not, not saying Switzerland, but we take Central America, all that kind of corridor. Yeah, you know, it's just, I, I mean, 
Belize, I, I went there last year. I, I thought it was beautiful snorkeling and so forth and diving, but I just thought it was such a primitive country. I mean, if you want to just get out of the rat race and be away from it all, I guess it's great. That's not my kind of thing. But the whole country is just, it's very primitive. There's not much of an economy there. They've got hardwoods. They've got some drug smugglers coming up through Mexico uh, or into Mexico, I guess, from South America. <laughs> you know, that's an economy. But, right. but you know, I don't know. Am I just missing something? Maybe I'm just being too much of a pessimist about it. I, <laughs> you know, no, other good, people seem to yeah. like it. I, I just didn't get it, to tell you the well, truth. It's, it's a good point, Jason. <laughs> With the, the thing that's been kind of amazing you to like me. You like how I point out the drug smuggler economy? No, <laughs> I know, I know. Well, again, as I tell everyone, you know, you don't go to Belize. You're not going to Belize. City. Most people come, they go to the islands, they go to Placentia, they go to the various areas within Belize. But, you know, one thing about Belize right now, of course, they're playing the, you know, no question, the, the end of the mind calendar. Tourism is through the roof. The Bachelor, all the TV shows, they've all been filming there and all the various things. The thing that's been surprising is the vast amount of people that you will see on the various islands that come from throughout the world, not just the United States and Canada to go to Belize. I mean, it is a very, very unique place. It's very different. It's very different than the Caymans. It's very different than Bermuda. It's very different than Nicaragua, Panama. You pick them all. It is very unique. It is a, I tell everyone, it's kind of a combination of a little bit of Jimmy Buffett, kind of Key West look to it on the islands, as an example. And there's been a fair amount of investment. I mean, if you go through and see who's been investing there, a lot of Hollywood is investing there. They are buying islands, Four Seasons Resorts. I mean, there's a lot going on in Belize, and I think a lot of it is it's easy to get to, a couple, few hours of flight, depending upon where the person lives in the U.S., and the hurdle is gone, which is language. And as you know, Jason, as I know you travel. Most people that you know in the United States don't like to deal with the, with the language barrier that you, you face in other, you know, other areas, and that's, that's what they sell off of. So who knows? I mean, time will tell. I can tell you in 15 years, I was there about 15 years ago. The development that has happened in 15 years is mind-boggling. I mean, you've got multi-million dollar homes and you've got on the islands, you know, people building resorts and hit with the, rece- with the real estate recession, but nowhere to the magnitude. Of course, you know, you don't have the subprime lending and those kinds of things. So they have not had that type of downturn. Some, but not to the but it's not for everyone. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I, I went looking down there for property for my real estate investors, and we looked around with a real estate broker who took us out on a boat. That's how he showed us property on a boat. A lot of it, and you know, I saw all the money that was flowing in there and and that kind of stuff. But gosh, you leave your resort, you leave your house, and there's just no infrastructure. I mean, it's, it's the sort of the banana republic kind of kind of life. You look at Los Angeles; it's turning into banana republic. You know, yeah, where yeah. you've got rich and poor and it's just i don't know i like i like big middle classes it gives me a feeling of stability yeah and it, it, it is very different i mean if you compare it to you know a recent visit I, I took just to medellin and you know how hot medellin is and the real estate market is tremendous plenty of americans and canadians investing there through the roof you know pablo, pablo escobar has been gone for 20 years it is a completely different environment in that kind of infrastructure than you have in belize as an example two different markets two different types of clientele as I tell most people, if you get to one of the islands and if you go to Amber's Key, and I'm just not saying that one only, you will see plenty of infrastructure, plenty of the expats. I mean, there's a lot of expat community in Belize, and they are involved in the community. And that's one thing that I think is important. It's not just a bunch of expats that just kind of sit and you know play cards together. They you know are involved in all the various things that go on. There's a, there's a lot of things that are going on in a lot of the different jurisdictions that get the expats And there's plenty of them looking. I mean, you saw the numbers last year. 9,000 people left the United States and gave up their U.S. citizenship. Mind-boggling to me. That is mind-boggling. It really is. Five years ago, there was 500. I mean, it's crazy, but that's the world, right? Well, people are getting scared of Obama and, you know, and and other factors. It's not just him. But, uh, you know, the government is is getting pretty intrusive in the U.S. nowadays. So, you know, things are, things they are changing. It's a pendulum that always swings back and forth. Good stuff. Well, hey, give out your website if you would and tell people where they can learn more. Absolutely, Jason. The website is Carlsberg, K-A-R-L-S-B-E-R-G, not like the beer, which is the C. So it's carlsberginsurance.com is the website. There's PDFs. There's tons of information they can download from there. And then my email address is the best place to get me. It's wayne at carlsberginsurance.com. Good stuff. Wayne Kurtz, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jason. appreciate it.
This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.